I saw a lot of places that violate your your rule on the way out here and all through Montana. Um, are, are you talking about the rule that my father gave to me is that if it has a gravel parking lot and serves beer and plays music and allows dancing, you keep on going. Yeah, that's it. That's a good place to uh, find out who's the toughest guy in Bozeman. Yeah, uh, a typical Montana bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I found a lot of places that uh, that violate those things. Now, if you have a paved parking lot, somehow that's better. Yeah. Um, and if they have live music versus jukebox, is that better or worse? Well, I I have taken my father's advice, and I I don't know. I'm Tom Roland Senior. And this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Fishing Points. There are a lot of great features of the Fishing Points app. You can go to your app store and you can get it and you can check it out. One of the best things that I like about that app is that it has really high quality nautical charts. We fish off the grid often, and sometimes you don't have any reception, so a lot of your stuff on your phone doesn't work. But you can download these maps right to your phone so you can study them when you're off the grid, or you can actually use them and still get depth data uh, while you are not connected to the internet. That's really cool. There's tons of things about fishing apps or fishing points that I think that you're really gonna like. You can go right now to tomrollandpodcast.com forward slash points and you can get 30% off a yearly subscription and you can also start your free trial right away. So go check that out. I think you're really going to like it. Barracuda Tackle is a place where we get our cast nets. They make awesome cast nets. They have tons you can choose from there. Go to barracudatackle.com, and they have tons of other stuff besides cast nets as well. It's a great resource. Go to boathammockstands.com and get a stand that goes right in your rod holder. It allows you to hang a hammock from your boat or in your boat, I should say. You'll have the most comfortable boat on the sandbar or if you go on overnight trips, it's fantastic for that as well. And we have Empire Boat Covers. Empire Boat Covers is a very good place to get an affordable boat cover. You go to empirecovers.com forward slash TRP and you can keep all those leaves from falling in your boat. It's fall. It's about to happen. You need to cover up all your stuff. A boat cover is a fantastic way to take care of your boats, but they have all kinds of covers. Boat covers for your car, for your RV, for your grill. They have covers for everything that you can imagine. And if you go to empirecovers.com forward slash TRP, you can get 15% off your order and free shipping. So don't forget to use that code TRP to take advantage of that. And now we're getting back to the show. All right, here we are, everybody. This is one of the most special podcasts that I can remember doing ever. And that is because we have three generations of Rollins. Right now, we're looking out over Bozeman. There is a new fire, a wildfire right above the M. If you're familiar with Bozeman, there's a, a big, very large M made out of white rocks on the Bridgers. And uh, just above that, a fire started yesterday. So actually, in the hotel room we're, we're in right now, we're looking out over that fire and all the attempts to put it out. It's pretty cool. But uh, right now, we've got Granddad, which is Tom Rowland Sr., got Hayden Rowland in the middle, got Turner Rowland right next to me, and uh, it's pretty cool. We've had three generations of Rowlands doing a little fishing trip. What do you guys, uh, you had any special, special things happen this week? We, it was just a great opportunity to fish with Turner one day and Hayden one day and both of them one day. And uh, weather's been great. Company's wonderful. Been a good time. <laughs> it has yeah, been a good time. We, we, uh, since, since I've been here, we've been able to do Slough Creek one day we did, which was really cool. A couple of camping trips around that. And then um, the Yellowstone River, the Missouri River. And uh, we've been able to take Granddad out on the Yellowstone the last couple of days. Um, it's pretty hot for September, I think. What was your favorite? My favorite? Well, the day that we all got to go together was the favorite. 
so yesterday probably um had my friend kevin sloan that's in in bozeman here he took us or didn't take us we we have four people so he uh uh i floated with him and you guys floated together stopped on the side of the river and ate those um elk brats that he brought which literally was like the best thing i've ever eaten it was, it was so pretty good. good it was, it so was good. pretty good uh, I think it was Polish sausage with like cheese in it and uh, a lot of beef fat. I think that makes a difference. I think you got to go like 80, 20 elk to beef. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of fat in those things. You taste it. That's why they tasted so good. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was great. But I like that. I mean, I, I like everything that we, we've we done out here because, um, you know, the fishing's been great. We've had lots of different kinds of fishing. The, uh, the Missouri River is quite a bit different than the Yellowstone, and Slough Creek is quite a bit different than both of those. And um, I don't know, it's a good little, good little tour to uh, experience all of that, um, different kinds of fishing. And, you know, walking way into a place is, is cool, and then drift, drift boats are cool. And Wade, Hayden and I did some wading off the road one time, and that was cool. Uh, but I just love it. I love the West. It's great. And you guys are out here so um let's fill everybody in because we've i've done a podcast with both of you before um tell us what you're currently doing now um because people are interested hayden what are you up to so right now i'm working in a wood shop in livingston um at total woodworks of montana and i'm currently not in school right now so that i can get my in-state tuition to go to montana state it makes it a lot cheaper um, I think it's probably the best time to not be in school right now. Why do you think that? Because of COVID? Yeah, because of COVID. A lot of online schools. My friends are saying that it's not not the same education. So I thought it'd be the best time to, you know, take a semester, a year off and, and work and and uh, spend time with friends and go outside and fish. Just hang out. And so what's the what's the situation at a college these days? I mean, You've got, um, everybody wants to, you got want to have parties. You want to get together. You want to be college students. Are people paying attention to the, the Corona guidelines or, or not? I think it depends on where you are. At least with like yeah. my friends, I've noticed that we're a little bit more cautious. Like we clean our apartment pretty much every day, spray it down with bleach. And then, but then like <laughs> some of my other friends, I've noticed that they don't pay attention at all. Really? Yeah. And what? How, how many people do you see getting it? Um, I've only heard of a few of my friends getting it. My roommate actually had a scare with it. She she got it, and we were under a government issue quarantine from the Montana Health Department for two weeks. So that was brutal. Can you fish in quarantine? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so the woodworking do you like the woodworking oh, i love it love it i mean you've always been an artist so do you see that as an extension of your of your art like of your drawing and and you know you've been good at all all kinds of different art over the years do you see this as a as a extension of that like a form of art it's kind of like developing like new art skills most of the stuff that i did in high school was a lot of 2d work with sharpies and pencils and it's really cool to to work on a piece of paper, but it's also pretty sweet to take a twenty foot board that you get from a sawmill, and uh, and take that and turn it to, into like a a nice dresser or something. Wow! So it's like my job is I'm the assistant, which basically means that the head carpenter trains me to do the stuff that he doesn't want to do, so that he can <laughs> have free time. <laughs> um. But I, I like get the wood and then I like choose the sections that we're going to use and, and uh, join them, plane them, rip them to width, length, anything that we need. Sand. I do a lot of sanding. Do you do a lot of sweeping? I do mostly sweeping. I think that's where, uh, I mean, I'm no carpenter, that's for sure. But um, I think most carpenters start out with a broom in their hand. <laughs> right? For sure, yeah. A lot of sweeping, a lot of vacuuming. Yeah, well, that's good. You're learning to pay your dues too, you know, which which is good for everything. All right, that's cool. Turner, what are you up to? Um, well, I'm entering my senior year at uh, Montana State. 
with um with what's going on it's a little different um but it it's still good i mean the teachers are having a hard time with webex and everything but i uh i'm selling some software and i am going to fish and hunt as much as possible um during this last time um that i know for sure i'll be in bozeman and uh kind of have as much free time as i do mm. so i'm yeah. just trying i'm trying to get it all in yeah well this is a good time for that but um you, the software sales that you're doing that started out as um as an internship right that you have mm-hmm. kind of uh progressed on past the internship or are you still in the internship no i'm i'm, I'm still considered an intern but the whole sales team for this one software product is interns or are interns so really we're doing everything from you know looking at looking at leads to actually selling the software to 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 um customizing workflows based on that software um so it's really more it's more of a full-time job than an internship Mm. which is which is great because i i learned a lot about myself doing this internship i learned that when i'm given a sense of responsibility for my work my work is dr- dramatically increases in quality. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's just a me thing or if that is something that can be applied to anything, you know, like if you, if you want somebody to do a, a job particularly well, it, maybe you should give them a sense of responsibility for it mm. and the ability to make their own decisions and decide, you know, what, what work is, is good work. Or maybe that's something that you have to kind of baby step to like I did through CS. Cause that was just customer service, right. For a software company. And you're just answering, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? What, what does this error message mean? Um, and then once I was given a sense of, of freedom and responsibility, I think I really did a lot better. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. It, yeah. It's interesting like that. So you're finding a good balance between working and going to school. Trying to, it's been a, uh, it's been a little bit of a, of a tougher adjustment than I thought. Definitely like working full time more than going to school though. (laughs) You do? Yeah. A lot of people don't. Yeah. No, I have a lot more free time when I am, um, when I'm just working full time. Um, cause usually, I mean, I'll do some stuff where like past five, if I have like a project I'm working on, then I'll like work till like, I don't know, eight or so at night. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I mean, I mean, me and Malin, we, I'd get off work. And um, she was doing Instacart this summer and we'd just we'd go hit the Gallatin. I mean, almost every day after work. Hmm. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to have the free time to do that right now, but I do have Wednesday mornings off. So maybe I'll go and get an elk hunt in closer to town or something like that. Yeah. And dad, you have, uh, you've had a big change in your life recently. Tell us about what you've been doing. Well, I have slowed down in my business quite a bit and uh, the home that, we raised, my wife and I raised our children for, and lived there for 45 years. We have sold and we've moved to another location, which uh, she just loves. It's a bright, airy, smaller. Uh, my problem has been disposing of <laughs> a lot of stuff that I've accumulated over a 45 year period of time. Uh, but I have made made that work and uh, uh, made her happy. And, yeah. And a happy wife is a happy life. What were some of the things that you, um, that you found as you were moving out of your house? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's quite interesting because uh, I, I love to shoot handguns and I've taken all the boys to, to the range and we've had a good time with uh, improving our marksmanship. And uh, I had a, a a small target pistol that I just really enjoyed shooting. And I said, well, I ought to get another one of these, which I did. And I remember taking it to the range and we shot it one time and somehow it disappeared. <laughs> and, and my son thinks that I accused him of taking it. And, and I asked many times if he knew where it was. And he said, no, I don't. And he thought I was being accusatory. It was a little bit accusatory. <laughs> <laughs> and I, the only thing I could do is apologize for that. But here we go. We've got this house that's probably 
in excess of 6,000 feet, and and uh, we've cleaned it out. And the new owner and my wife are walking through the house, and the new owner looks up at a shelf that's higher than you can reach. I don't know how anybody could get there without a ladder. And she said, what is that up there on that shelf? And my wife said, I don't know. It's probably one of Tom's handguns. <laughs> <laughs> So sure enough, it was the twenty-two pistol that Tom thinks I accused him of taking, but I didn't. I, or if I did, I didn't mean to. Uh, so that was one of the big things that I discovered. Also, I discovered a cowboy hat that I had uh, forty-five years ago that uh, I had swapped a silver belly hat. If anybody knows what that is, it's a silver hat for this bull rider's black hat. And uh, it disappeared, but I found it. It was in the back of a closet. I also found some stuff underneath the beds that I had hidden. I don't know who I was hiding them from. <laughs> it seemed like it, I hid them more for myself than anybody else. Maybe. <laughs> and it, you found something else. Um, recently, <laughs> that that isn't as easy to dispose of. I mean, I don't know of a lot of people that move out of their house and the the two things that they find is a handgun that they lost a long time ago and a and a hand grenade. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, my father in law uh, was uh, stationed in Japan, and right after the war, and he was flying medvac with the Army Air Corps. And after the war, uh, he and his, some of his buddies went to Tokyo. And before they went into Tokyo, the supply sergeant said, you must have a, we a weapon before you go into town. So they said, well, we don't have any weapons. He said, well, come in the supply room. We'll, ex we'll issue you one. So he went in the supply room, and they issued him a, a M1 carbine. And he took it to town, and they came back after their visit to Tokyo and got on their plane or getting ready to leave or getting ready to leave to get on their plane. And they went to supply sergeant and said, uh, we want to turn this uh, carbine in. And he said, uh, what carbine? He said, the one that we checked out this morning. He said, I don't know anything about what you're talking about. So well, we got these weapons that we picked up at the supply room. What do we do with them? The supply sergeant said, I don't care what you do with them. Take them home with you. So he brought this home along with a fragment grenade, a Japanese fragment gr grenade. And somehow it had been placed on a piece of furniture in our house on the top of it. And uh, this is the same room where we ate Christmas dinner for 45 <laughs> years. <laughs> so... I told my wife, I said, we need to properly dispose of this. And I took it to the fire department. And uh, at the, it was early in the morning, and the door was locked. I knocked on the door of the fire department. Nobody came, and I went back to my car and I was on my truck, and I was getting ready to leave. And this fireman came out, and he said, can I help you? And I said, yes, uh, I have a, a grenade here. I'd like to dispose of properly. <laughs> and he said, what? A what? I said, a grenade. So where is it? I said, it's in the cup holder in my truck. Would you like for me to get it? He said, oh, no, no, no. Stay right there. Don't, d d don't go anywhere close to it. I said, okay. So what are we going to do? He said, we're going to call the police. And I said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I sat down and waiting for the policeman to come. Policeman doesn't come, and I said, "Hey, have you guys got any coffee in the in the <laughs> station here?" He said, Let me see. Hey, Joe, we got any coffee? No, we're all out. He said, "No, I'm sorry." I said, "Well, can I drive up to the uh, convenience store and get a cup of coffee?" Oh no, no, don't don't move. I don't want you moving that that grenade in that car. Uh, you just stay right there. So the policeman comes, and he said, "What's your problem?" I said, "I don't have a problem." <laughs> <laughs> He said, give me your name, address, and phone number, and where you'd 
work, where he lives, all this stuff. So what you got? What do you got? And I said I got a grenade that my grandfather, my father-in-law, brought back from the army. So what kind is it? And I said it's Japanese. He said, "Oh my God!" He said, "We got to call the bomb squad." I said, "Oh man, for <laughs> yes, sir, okay." So I sit <laughs> back down again, and I'm trying to be on my best behavior. Uh, Because I might be in big trouble, and I don't want to be in trouble. So finally, the bomb squad shows up, and the guy walks over there, and he said, what you got? And I said, it's an unexploded grenade. Where is it? I said, it's in the cup holder in my truck. So he walks over there, and he reaches in and picks it up. and said, oh, I can take care of this. So that's the end of that story. But it was (laughs) kind of exciting for a while. (laughs) I guess so. Um, (laughs) So uh, I looked on the, um, all you got to do is Google Chattanooga hand grenade. And (laughs) there is, there are, it's full of stories, full of stories. And here's a picture of it in your cup holder. And it says, many people like to put drinks and snacks in their cup holder, but one Chattanooga man came to firefighters for help with a World World War II hand grenade in his cup holder. You read that right. A more than 75 year old hand grenade. Chattanooga Fire Department officials say they recovered the grenade on Thursday morning. CFD says a man arrived at the Hickson Fire Hall and informed the crew that he had a World War II Japanese hand grenade in his truck and needed to help to get rid of it. Firefighters took precaution, called the bomb squad. I mean, your story's dead accurate. Um, but the funny thing is, is you can go to the Facebook thing. and There's quite a few comments about who, what kind of redneck you would have to be to have a unexploded hand grenade and oh, what yeah. a waste it was to, I mean, it depends. Like half of the comments are from people that think you're a redneck. If you have a hand grenade, the other half of the comments are the people that were thinking about, man, what a waste. Think about all the good fishing you could have done with that hand grenade. <laughs> think about all the other things you could have done with this hand grenade, hand, hand grenade, not hand grenade. That's a funny, that's a word that people say wrong. Hand grenade. Hand grenade. Uh, like gosh, it's not a hang. Yeah, no, costume, no, with an H? No. <laughs> yeah. It's not spelled that way. No. But hand grenade. You don't say hand grenade. You say hand grenade. Well, it the the grenade still had the pin in it, and I knew it was still could be exploded with the proper, uh, you know, uh, but the pin. You hit a bump the, in your cup holder yeah. is what you're trying to say. <laughs> no, I don't think that. I don't think that it could have been detonated just with. So, who found the gr- the grenade? My lovely wife. I was afraid she might use it on me, so I decided to <laughs> take it to the fire department. Let them get. She rid put of it. under your pillow. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, so this worked out. This trip worked out really great um, because we were we were supposed to go elk hunting today. Today's the opener of elk hunting season. We were going to go archery elk hunting. Turner has been training for a whole year, has everything all sighted in, ready to go. But today happens to be like 95 degrees in Bozeman. So I don't know if it was going to be really good. So we scheduled another elk hunt with Kevin, and uh, that's going to be really good. So it worked out perfect that we could we could have – it was a perfect time for uh, Granddad to come out here and, and visit. So what do you think about the uh, – the the lifestyle and the the life that these boys are living. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity that they have, and I'm glad that they have the opportunity. It's a uh, a great experience. You can't get in much trouble on the river. I don't know about that. As far Man, as you can <laughs> shoot, you can shoot a bald eagle. You can do all kinds of, of stuff. <laughs> well, so cool. you can go to a spring creek you're not supposed to fish into. Well, you can get that kind of stuff. You're not going to get accosted in a in a bar. Uh, I don't know. I saw a lot of places that violate your your rule on the way out here and all through Montana. Are, um, are you talking about the rule that my father gave to me? Is that if it has a gravel parking lot and serves beer and plays music and allows dancing, you keep on going. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's a good place to uh, find out who's the toughest guy in Bozeman. Yeah. Uh, a typical Montana bar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I found a lot of places that, uh, that violate those things. Now, if you have a paved parking lot, somehow that's better. Yeah. 
Um, and if they have live music versus jukebox, is that better or worse? Well, I, I have taken my father's advice and I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, somehow I think that you do, but that's another story. <laughs> I think it's the windows. <laughs> um, well, if there are windows that helps, yeah. but I do know that I, I thought, that the 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 piece of advice that I've heeded to is if it has a gravel parking lot, serves beer on tap, and has live music, that's a place that you definitely want to be out of there before midnight. Not a lot of good things happen there after midnight. It's like Roadhouse. Patrick Not a lot Swayze. of good things after happen after midnight, anyways. That's right. Patrick Swayze. That was a great movie. <laughs> Pain don't hurt. <laughs> you know that movie. Yeah, I mean, I I haven't watched all of it. I've, what you? How do you even start it and not finish it? Is that the Family Guy thing? Uh, yeah, it's where the Family Guy driving, thing. kicking Roadhouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't Peter know about gets, the Family yeah, Guy. Yeah, yeah, man. Peter gets obsessed with Roadhouse, and he's driving around with his legs. And every time he <laughs> he kicks his, the steering wheel to turn, and every time he does, he goes Roadhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen that Family Guy, but it sounds pretty awesome. Oh, but man, Roadhouse is—they take a, him down like a really windy street, and he's kicking it all the time. Oh, okay. Well, Roadhouse is a is a classic movie where they have to bring in Patrick Swayze. He's an awesome, super famous bartender, or not bartender, bouncer, and they bring in a bouncer to clean up the bar. Now they don't close it down, and you know, like pave the parking lot, get a little higher class of of entertainment in there they decide that no we're going to let the same people come in but we're going to have this bouncer here that's going to whoop them if it gets out of if it gets out of hand but his deal was you got to always be polite so he'd walk up and he'd say excuse me sir you're going to have to leave and then they would turn around and kick him and then it went down Hmm. and patrick swayze was supposed to be like george st pierre he knew how to kill people in a million different ways. But when you go back and look at it, it, it doesn't quite hold up. Like after you see somebody that really knows how to kick somebody and then you watch Patrick. So he tried to do it and it, he should have had a stunt double. Yeah. Yeah. You, oh, you see that a lot in, mm. in uh, Hollywood or movies or whatever, you know, the, it's funny how if you talk to somebody that knows a lot about something and then watches a movie about it mm. and, you know, it'll, it'll tell you what's wrong with it. Well, either way, it was it was a great movie. <laughs> it really was. You should watch it. Um, so what are we going to do this afternoon? Well, I think we're going to the Museum of the Rockies, right? It's probably going to so, be a yeah. great thing to do on a day that it's 95 degrees in September. Yeah. Well, have I, you ever, I, has anybody ever been to the museum? Mm-mm. I've been. You have? Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. I mean, they have like one exhibit that is there all the time. It's a dinosaur exhibit. And I mean, these dinosaurs are taken all across Montana and up into Alberta. Like that's really where like the T-Rex and the big predators from what I understand are and were concentrated in, or at least they're for whatever reason, their fossils were. And so if you go to a place like the Missouri breaks, that's where a lot of these big T-Rexes are taken from. And I went turkey hunting there this past spring and it is, it's really the place that outlaws went to escape, um, escape all the, all the parties hunting for them Mm. because there are these canyons and they're just like endless canyons and you can glass for a long way. And you can kind of look at these ridges that come up. And when I was turkey hunting there, you know, you could see elk all, all coming up and down these ridges. But when you get in the ridges, it, it's like this endless Canyon that is way steeper than it looks. And it has all these thorns and, all this nasty stuff and they irrigate these fossils out of these cliff faces. And I don't know. I mean, someone's doing some heavy lifting over there because those does those dinosaur bones can't be light Mm. and they take them out of these sides of cliffs and have to hike way up, like pretty much a mountain. I mean, to give you an idea of how steep it is, like the world record sheep or bighorn or, or at least the continental record comes from the Missouri breaks. So, you know, sheep like that really steep, rocky stuff. And that's all there, there is in the breaks. It's, it's really cool. And, you, you know, when you get there, they have maps of where you're going. If you go up to Glacier, like around Two Medicine, if you've ever been there, there's like all these museums that you just 
you ever seen that uh, Black Mirror episode where the girl, like the opening is that girl and she drives into the desert and she comes across that little museum with that guy and he ends up having all those like really messed up memories. Mm-mm. I didn't see that one. You didn't see that one where the, where the dad is in the electric chair. Mm, no, I haven't and then, seen this one. You haven't seen that? No. Oh. Dude, you got to watch this Black Mirror episode. It's crazy. He is like this, I, I can't remember how it, how it goes down, but he's somehow connected to all these like really messed up projects. And so he ends up getting, I can't even remember. It's been so long since I've seen it, but those museums in two medicine are kind of like that. They're just like in the middle of nowhere, like, mm. like, you know, gravel parking lot. <laughs> and it shows you where these dinosaurs get taken out of. And it's right where you're fishing. Like it's, really? it, yeah. I mean, it's super cool. You go up there and so maybe like, we'll see some of those bones today. I'm sure you will. Yeah. I mean, At like the museum here, right? I mean, this yeah, museum yeah. here is pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's pretty famous. I mean, I've heard a lot of people famous. say that if you come to Bozeman, you got to go to that museum. So that's what we're going to do today. That'll be, that'll be pretty cool. Cause, um, uh, last couple of days, I think we wore granddad out. <laughs> we were supposed to do a four hour float that turned into an eight hour float. <laughs> and then we did a, then we did a four hour float that turned into a five and a half hour float. Um, how you hanging in there, Dad? I'm doing well, thank you. I recovered, doing pretty good for a older gentleman. How, how much of an older gentleman are you? You mean in age, mm-hmm. a number well, of years? It, you can, you can, you can. Um, Eighty-two. Okay, it could be any any criteria you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Eighty-two. Eighty-two. So, in your life. Is it fair to say that you've seen outhouses to Teslas? Yes, sir. We have. Uh, in fact, uh, on I can remember uh, Halloween night many, many years ago uh, when we would trick or treat and we'd steal somebody's outhouse and put it in the middle of a road. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that was was, ever, was there ever anyone in it? No, no, we didn't ever get anybody in it, but we did certainly see a lot of tires squeal and hear them when you put that outhouse in the middle of a road on a dark night. Uh. <laughs> That's, and so you just kind of hang out in the bushes and wait for somebody to blast through it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you ever see that happen? No, we just saw a lot of rubber burned of them stopping real quick. Uh-huh. <laughs> Those dad blamed kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. my outhouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you think the biggest, the biggest changes you've seen in your lifetime that have changed the way that, that we live? What do you think those have been? Well, I grew up in Tennessee in a, in a fairly rural part of the state. And I would say the TVA authority and the expansion of the electrical grid across the South did uh, more for anything, especially for manufacturing, uh, the ability to generate the power and provide power for the equipment to manufacture things. Uh, also, opportunity for people to be access have access to the rest of the world through TV. Now I can remember the first TV we ever had was a seven by seven inch uh black and white. <laughs> and that was quite a quite an event to be able to have dinner. I guess maybe one of the advents would be the TV tray table. Yeah. <laughs> Where you sit right in front of that little TV uh, at dinner time. <laughs> and have a TV dinner. Yeah. And have a TV dinner. <laughs> TV dinners used to be actually not bad. Like a TV dinner today is kind of gross. But right. right. <laughs> that was like pretty fancy. It used to come in a metal. It used to be all metal. You put it in the oven and it would have like turkey and dressing. I can't even remember that. Do you remember like what you did before TV? Would you, I mean, like gather around the radio 
and there used to be radio programs, which is now the modern podcast. I, I envision people sitting around listening to this as a family. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Well, I, I, I would say my, my dad was a baseball fan and, and, uh, whenever there was a game on, he would turn it on the radio and we'd sit down and listen to it together. And, uh, that that was quite entertaining. Uh, sometimes it was kind of boring when you didn't know who the players were, but he knew most of the players. And uh, but he was drafted when he was thirty five years of age, because at that time I was the only child, and the United States was prepping for a possible land invasion of Japan, so they were taking anyone between the age of 18 and 35, even if you were married or, or had children. If you had one child, they, you were subject to the draft. It was quite an experience to see a 35-year-old go through basic training with 18-year-olds. And that uh, when he came back from the service, he didn't have a job, so he had to find out something to do and, and do it. Uh, and he got into the army surplus business and, uh, would find manufacturing plants that needed things like picks and shovels, because at that time there were no metal tools available mm. because all the metal was being used in the war effort. So, uh, he'd go to a military base that was closing and auctioning off all these things. He'd purchase them, drive them, buy a truck, drive it to Chattanooga, and sell it to the manager of the DuPont construction plant. So he, like when you say all these things, like like shovels, picks, shovels, axes. Shovels, picks, axes, hard hats, uh, pipe fittings. Hmm. And so that stuff was super hard to come by. Very hard. So you're these guys' great-grandfather, my grandfather, was he was an entrepreneur he was a he was he's a hustler yes yes he was he was willing to do whatever he needed to do honestly to feed his family and support himself i never heard that that he did that um you know you like to tell stories but you haven't told that story very <laughs> often because i don't i don't remember that of him selling army surplus or military surplus right first First vehicle we had after the war was a 44 model Jeep. And we drove that four or five years. It didn't even have a top on it. Like a Willys Jeep? Yep, exactly. That's what I learned how to drive on when I was 12 years old. Thing had a clutch on it that'd break your leg. Exactly. <laughs> I've driven one of those one time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you don't feather the clutch on that thing, buddy. And I thought, I'll never learn how to do this. Uh, oh, I, shoot. I can't. The fire, is, the fire is update. The fire is, Wait, is see burning. Those, see those yeah, burning more on the other side of the that, ridge, I looks like. They've been dumping a bunch of that red stuff, whatever that is. Yeah, For people. I just need a, listening at home we can see of, of the um we can see the fire this fire i don't know well, if it has a no, name that's just um, or not that was just the they they must have just dropped the retardant or whatever you call it the yeah. red the red powder it looked like a fire was was really blowing up but i think it was that red powder so anyway sorry dad to interrupt you so, so when i was trying to learn how to drive with that <laughs> clutch like that I, I never thought i'd learn because i get the clutch about halfway out and then all of a sudden, bam, it would kick back out, and that Jeep would jump like a <laughs> bucking horse. And my dad said, let it out slow, son. Let it out slow. <laughs> and I tried again, and it would be jumping. And, and I came home that first night, and I was laying in my bed upstairs, and I said, I won't ever learn how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's gotten a lot easier. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd say. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot easier than driving that old thing. Well, even that, was, that Austin Healy, man, you drive like manuals today, and then you drive his Austin Healy, and it's significantly harder. Well, the Austin Healy's a lot easier driving those Jeeps. Oh, was, yeah. And then when, then when I got in the Army, we'd, uh, you'd have to double clutch some of those deuce and a halves that they had. 
And that's a that's pretty interesting too. But we've seen a lot of what's a double clutch? Well, you take it out of gear. If you're going from first to second, you're in first. Move it up to neutral. And you have to push the clutch in again before you put it into second. And then you just have to keep going through the whole gearbox on that. Some of those old trucks had six six uh, gear six gear box and and that was a challenge. Of course if that's all you knew how to do it was not a problem. Some of the kids now might have a problem with it because they got all them automatic transmissions now. Weak legs. Yeah. Skipping leg day. <laughs> Skinny jeans. All kinds of stuff. Not yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you skipped leg day in a long time. No. No. This leg day is just every day out here. You walk up these mountains. This is leg day. There's a lot of, last time I went hunting with Turner, it was uphill all the way. Even after we had gone all the way uphill and we were going back to the truck, it was still uphill somehow. I don't know how that happened, but every time we get to the top, the highest peak I could see, Turner would say, well, they're probably up there. And <laughs> I'd turn around and behind me, there'd be another peak. We'd climb up that one. Then he'd go, hmm. Thought they'd be here. They're probably up there. And then I, I didn't even know there was another peak. And we kept going. And then we get to the top and he's like, Well, this is probably as high as we're gonna go. We'll probably make it back to the truck. But we should go over that peak right there before we go back to the truck. So we, again we go up to go down. And then I don't know. Up was not as bad as going down. Once we finally went down, it's 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 legit out here. You 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 do a lot of walking, you do a lot of driving. Um a lot of rowing. A lot of rowing. It's a physical. It's a physical life. It's good. Good for you. Fresh air, exercise. Yes, sir. Stuff French toast. <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty good yeah, this morning. Great, we went great to the breakfast. Went to the jam on Main Street, and they have a stuffed French toast. Which, um, if you eat that, you better plan on getting some exercise afterwards. But that's that's definitely a favorite for here. So, um, Dad, I have a lot of people that have asked me many times like um how to get into the outdoor world how to how to um follow your passion how to do um something similar to what what I've done and a lot of times the question arises what did your dad think about it when you started doing this and doing this meaning um guiding for the most part um so I've never really asked you about that. Well, like, that's that's interesting. Uh, when you went to the university, you came back after your first semester and said, I don't know what I want to do this summer. I'm thinking about uh, doing some things. And I said, well, let's, let's take a look at it and see. So I found a, the contractor that supplied the labor for the national parks. And I said, well, you may – want to think about a, a, a summer job where you don't need a car. You really don't know anybody. You're going to be away from home and you can do just about whatever you want to do. And you're not going to have anybody judging you. I said, what about working at one of the national parks? And you said, well, I think maybe I'd like that. And so you did, and you became a certified bed maker and toilet scrubber. Mm-hmm. It's good for me. It was. And and uh, you loved the West. You had a chance to fish about every day after you'd get through working. I can remember you calling and saying, Dad, I caught a fish today on the first fly that I tied myself. Mm -hmm. And you were so excited about that. And I said, well, that's great. So then the next year you came home at Christmas and you said, I think I want to go to Alaska and work. And that put a fear in me. Because the only thing that you can really do in Alaska with without a car or without an airplane is work on a lobster boat or a crab boat or something. And the survival rate of those folks is very low. And I said, well, I think you ought to consider it. Let's see what else we can find. I looked in the Orvis newspaper and found an ad for the Western Rivers Fly Fishing Guide School. And I sent that to you, and I said, 
why don't you think about this? This might be an alternative to Alaska. Uh, I didn't want to say to you or to any of the children, you can't do that because I wanted you to be able to make your own decisions and and thrive that way. So you went to the school, and uh, and they promised that if you completed the school, they would pardon me, give you a job. And so the fellow that owned the outfit and headed up the school said, yeah, I'll give him a job. I want him to work for me. So then the next year, you went back and you said, Dad, I think I'd like to do this. I said, well, son, I only have one piece of advice for you. Whatever you decide to do, pursue it with a passion and be the best that you can be. And uh, That's kind of here we are now. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm very proud of you and you've done an outstanding job and, and, provided your sons with the same type of opportunity. Well, it's interesting because you said you, you know, you get to these places in parenting where you, you don't really want to say no and you don't really want to tell them that they can't do it, but there's a real fine balance there. How do you, how do you deal with, um, with that balance of telling some young person that it's not such a good idea? versus letting them go ahead and do it and making the mistakes that you know that they're going to make. Yeah. Well, we all have to, there's a famous general or admiral, excuse me, that was the head of the uh, nuclear submarine program for the United States named Hyman Rickover. And one of his famous quotes was, we must learn by the mistakes of others because we will not live long enough to make them all ourselves. So, as a parent, a child has it, a child is going to make mistakes and you have to be able to work with them to try to help them learn from those mistakes. Uh, you can't, and this is hard to say, but you can't be a buddy to your children. You got to be a parent. And, uh, because there is a big difference between being a buddy and being a parent. And sometimes you have to put the hammer down and say, no, we're not going to. And that's hard because me being a parent, I want only the best for my children that they can achieve. And, and education, I think, gives the children the opportunity to accept information and filter it and be able to make a decision based on the, the facts. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the things that's the most important for education, not necessarily what you learn in the classroom, but these other opportunities that prepare you for the future. Uh, some of the stuff that you study in school, you'll never, ever think about again, but at some point you may. Mm. What do you think about um, the the way that education has changed? How do you see education changing since, let's say, since you got out of high school and we're thinking about going to college versus Turner and Hayden right here? Well, <clears throat> pardon me. Two days after I graduated from high school, I was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and uh that took a lot of uh, crazy ideas that I might have had out of my mind because I didn't have time. Uh, that was something that happened throughout your entire generation, though, right? Like, I mean, that part of that that time of the of the world, there was not there was none of this follow your passion. You should do something you want to do, right? Well, that's right. It was more structured than than it is now. Uh, I had I had a an appointment to West Point and decided that I could not stand to be away from this young lady for four years that I was dating. And I turned it down, but I still had an eight year military obligation. And thank goodness that's not the lady that I married, but, uh, uh, 
I went ahead and spent my eight years in the service, in the reserve primarily. And, uh, which occupied a lot of my, my free time. So I didn't have, I didn't have a whole lot of choices to do things. I had mm-hmm. to, I had to make uh, a living because my wife and I had children very early. Uh, first child was born at age 21. So I didn't have much uh, opportunity to fiddle. I had to get the ground running. And so now, as as you fast forward to today, you hear a lot more about following your passion and, and doing something that you love versus, like, just getting after it. Um, what do you think about that right now? Well, to be honest with you, and this is not a good answer, I haven't given that much thought at all. Uh I guess it's according to what your passion is, but as a parent, the only thing that you can really ask for is that your children do pursue something that they really would like to do because they're going to have to do it for a long time. There's none of us, or I don't know of many folks that have the resources when they're born to support them till they pass. So, you got to keep going after it. Yeah. What about you guys? You getting any kind of clarity on something that you want to do for your life? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, honesty is a very important trait. <laughs> well, a lot of that comes. Um, I, I think that comes from experience. And I have a lot of people uh, that listen to this that are interested in doing something that they want to do, but they really just don't know what it is. And their question is like, well, how do I find out what it is? And that to me is, is based in experience. <laughs> you need to experience the good and the bad, like, like you're doing, Hey, you need to go to work. You need to try something and say, you know, I like that. And I'm learning something, but I definitely don't want to do that for the rest of my life. Or maybe you do like me, like I started guiding and I liked it right away, but it wasn't until I saw some older people, some of the guides that I was guiding with that had some of the things that I wanted in my life, like a family and a house and a, and a life, like every one of my friends and most of the people that I knew were still asking me, you know, seven or eight years in, when are you going to get a real job? And I was like, I don't know. I think I have one. Like, I think this is a real job. And you know, it wasn't about how much money you're making or whatever, but I saw other people that were doing what I thought you could do. And it opened my, opened my eyes. Like, hmm, you can be a fishing guide. You know, maybe you're going to have to also be a carpenter. Maybe you have to also be something else, but you can be a fishing guide for your whole life. And then it was like, but you can't be a fishing guide all year long in Jackson, Wyoming, because unless you want to be an ice fishing guide, um, hmm. <laughs> So I realized, okay, well, you're going to have to move. And then that lifestyle is difficult as well. The vagabond chasing the season lifestyle. So anyway, we figured out a way to make it work. But um, I, I think that that if if people don't know, young people don't know what they want to do, it should be an opportunity, not a not a problem. Like you have this opportunity to go find some other things that you may like or may not like, and you're young and unattached and you don't have any bills. And so after this little season's over, you could try a different job. You could try a different location. You could try a different something. And basically I think that if you don't know what you want to do, you probably haven't tried enough things. Well, I might say that uh, one of, your cousins uh, had a job picking lettuce in England. And uh, I asked him how he liked that. He said, well, granddad, it was extremely hard work. And I did determine that I didn't, don't think that I could support a family on the wages from picking lettuce. But he said, you know, uh, 
I said, well, you know, the good thing about that is you eliminated something. You don't have to worry about considering that again for a career. But you have to, I never had the opportunity to interview for another job because, and it worked out okay. But uh, I'm just very fortunate to not many people my age that have been in one profession in one area, all of their work and career. Mm. That's unusual, but it's worked out for me. And so you're, you're close to winding it down. You're 82 and still going to work. Yes. What's the plan here? Uh, well, they may, they may take me out of there 10 toes up <laughs> with my hands folded in front of me saying, Oh, don't he look natural? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you want or, or not? You know, I don't really know what I want, uh, but for 60 years, I've gotten up every morning, shaved, put on a, a tie and gone to work. And it's kind of something that I do. And I enjoy doing it. I see a lot of people that I, and I do business with the folks that I really enjoy b- being around. So. I don't know of any reason to hang it up. Hmm. So 10 toes up. Right. <laughs> Old 10 toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, anybody got anything else interesting to talk about? Well, I think finding what you want to do is that process elimination. You know, I think... I think a lot of people can get discouraged when they when they try something out and it doesn't work for them. Like there's a when you, when you try something out sometimes there's an you expect it to be perfect, right? But a lot of times you got to got to try out slightly different things like you know, with me and elk guiding. I I loved elk guiding, but it wasn't something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. But maybe outfitting would be, or maybe something in that area. Like I I think a lot of people get really discouraged. Like if they, if they want to do sales, if they're really into sales and they start in the, the, the tech sales and they don't like it. Well, that doesn't mean you just don't like sales. It means you might it's not like tech sales, right? Same with, with guiding. If you, if you're always wanting to be the person on the bow, then maybe there's a place for that in your life. I don't think you need to directly eliminate it right when you figure out that it's not something that you want to do for a career. Yeah. Because there could be an offshoot of it. Like, I don't know, exactly. maybe, maybe you love fishing and you try guiding and you don't really like guiding. That doesn't mean that you might not want to, you know, um, have a kind of reinvent the industry with an online version of a fly shop or uh, some other way. Like there's a lot of ways that to be, to make a living doing something that you want. And it might not be as simple as, as a to B like I'm going to be a fishing guide. And then even then there's a ton of different kinds of fishing guides. Like, you know, maybe you don't like, uh, rowing down the river for whatever reason, well, you might be a wade, wade guy, you or know, you might or like might, pull it. Yeah, yeah, might like something else. Um, but I don't know. Again, that goes back to you know trying it and not being afraid to to give something a try. But um, you know, some of the some of the advice that we've been talking about lately um, that I think is is so incredible, and it was. Um, really brought to my attention when I did this uh, podcast with Sailing Sophisticated Lady. And, you know, I was asking, um, I was asking him about, like, how did you make this jump into from having a regular job, then living on a sailboat and then traveling the world and making a living, living on a sailboat? And he was like, well, that's simple. Best advice I could give you is don't have any bills. Because if you want a freedom, if you want freedom in your life, if you want freedom uh, to do something that you want to do, that all stops with a car payment. 
that all stops with a mortgage. Like you can only be away for, you know, three months before all of a sudden somebody comes and takes your house, you know, or, or your car or whatever. And, um, so that's something that Hayden and I've been talking about when we're fishing is like, if you want freedom, pure freedom in your life, just make sure you don't have any of those monthly bills. That's, that is the way. And that's why I think a lot of people have a hard time. Like I'm in this career. I want to change into doing something that I really like to do. I don't like doing this, whatever it is that they're doing, but it's really hard to change because, you know, at the end of the month, somebody's got their hand out for well, how, for a bill. How do you set that up? And how do you, how do you know when it's time to have a mortgage? Like, I think it would be very hard for someone who wants to have an investment in an early <laughs> age, like myself, wants to buy a house, maybe rent it out for some monthly income. How do you set that up to where you don't have any bills for a certain amount of time in your life? And how do you know when it's okay to have that and set it up in a way to where maybe you're not as restricted? I'd pass that over to granddad. Well, Turner, that's, you know, I never had that opportunity. Uh, I figured if I needed extra money, I'd just make more calls and uh, work a little harder. And for a period of time, uh, I was uh, saddled with a, a large amount of debt for primarily for education of children so, so 18 years of private school uh, elementary education uh, 18 years of private secondary education uh, college education for for three for a period of anywhere from four to four and a half to five years uh, three weddings, uh, purchased a house and all of these other things. And at some point I felt like I was up to my nose in, in debt. And I said, gosh, I'm just going to have to work a little harder. And I had some very good breaks and I did. And, and it's a extremely rewarding experience to wake up in the morning and say, I don't owe anyone anything other than to try to act like a responsible, kind gentleman. And uh, so, but how that happens, I don't know. Some of the financial planners could help you more than that, but most of them say you need to accumulate an amount of money for a down payment on a house of at least 20%, uh, and then you don't go buy that new truck or that new fast boat or the new drift boat, you may have to, the first purchases that you make on that kind of basis be for cash and they might be a lower standard of what you'd really like to have. And then when you get to where you don't owe anybody any money, you pay cash for things. But that means that you have got to spend less than you make because you can certainly become a slave to the bank. <laughs> sure. I think um, that's all incredibly good advice. I would say if I were to add anything to it is that before you, I think when you decide that it's time to get a mortgage, you decide that it's time to, um, to acquire some bills or whatever is a, is a place in your life where you, you're very comfortable with where you are. You're very, very comfortable. You don't have any of these regrets like, man, I sure would like to go backpack across England, or I sure would like to, you know, walk the Appalachian Trail, or I sure would like to do all these things. And you've got this, you've got this yearning to do some things. That's not the yeah. time mortgage on a house because you've just kissed that goodbye and you still want it. That's a bad, bad place to be, in my opinion. Right. In my opinion, the place to be is, you know what? I wanted to walk the Appalachian Trail. I walked the Appalachian Trail. Now I'm really in love with this girl right here, and I am ready 
to get married and I am ready to start my family and I am ready. I welcome this mortgage. I want this mortgage. I want to be ingrained in this community that I'm in. I want to do my best in this job that I have. I am welcoming these bills and I'm happy with where I am. And that's a big, big, major difference between <sighs> I'm saddled with this mortgage. What I really want to do is go hike the Appalachian Trail. And I'm going to do that one day. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be in that place where you have something that you really want to do. If you have something you really want to do, now's the time, man. Now is the time. Get on it, plan it, do it. And have no regrets. Have no regrets. Live your life to the absolute fullest. Do the things that you want to do. And of course, you're going to find some other things. But there's, of course, I have places that come up on my radar and I'm like, man, I'd like to fish there, but not right now. I don't want to be, I, you know, like when you guys were, were, were young, you got wrestling matches, you got football games, you got lacrosse games, you got all the, I don't want to miss that. I am welcoming yeah. not doing that. I am happy with that. I am happy to say, I'm going to put world travel on a, on pause and maybe I'll get there one day, but there's nothing I would rather be doing than this right here than watching this lacrosse game, than watching this wrestling match, than, than watching this track meet, something like that. Like, if somebody gave me a free ticket to the Seychelles, I wouldn't even take it. Like, that is being happy in your life, I think. Being so happy with where you are that you welcome everything that comes with it. And I think that's a major, major difference than living a life of regret. We talk about the concept of both a lot. Mm -hmm. you know it's one of my I, big things i say it's not an yeah. either or it's a both yeah i mean you know in various decisions of my life where i you know can branch off to one area or the next whether it was sticking with guiding or going on to the sales things you know you always bring up the concept of why not both is there room for both as far as getting about, bills yeah yeah well, i mean is room. there room to travel and have bills like on especially on the concept of investments well, there's, there's room to, you know, today you, you, you have some opportunities that, that, I mean, I'm not that much old, I mean, older than you. And I mean, 30 years and, and dad's 30 years older than me. And the opportunities that I had to do some things didn't exist when he, when he was my age. And now there's some opportunities that you guys have that didn't exist. I mean, particularly with the internet, you have the opportunity to work anywhere you want to live. You can live in a lot of different places, but here's what it boils down to. You want to go and do something like the Appalachian Trail is a great example. A lot of people want to do that in their life. Maybe it's the Continental Divide Trail. Maybe it's that you want to float every river in Montana. Maybe it's, I don't know what it is, but maybe it requires an extended time away, 60 days. I don't even know that many people that are pretty well established that can stop working for 60 days and pay their ha house payment, their, their car payment, their electric bill, their water bill, their insurance, their, you know, now you have, a, you, you've also acquired a dog. Now you have to put the dog in the kennel. Now enough? you have to do all this stuff and you add up all of this stuff. And it's not that you can't afford to pay whatever it is, whatever it costs to go hike the Appalachian trail. It's that you don't have the resources to stop working and keep going with everything that you've got going and go away. So in some situations, it's, I, I like to say nothing's impossible, but there are some things where you put the pencil to the paper and it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And if you want the freedom to do those things and you have it in the back of your head, like, I don't even know what I want to do, but I want to do something and I'm going to figure it out one day. Well, that's not the time to get a mortgage. I think that's a lot of, I think a lot of people are in that situation of course where they, they are. They're just like, I don't know what it, what, what it is. I don't know if it's travel. Of course they are. I don't know if it's, if it's some great adventure, but I want to do something. Right. And here's the mistake. Here's where people get way off track. In my opinion is some people is that they think, okay, well maybe if I bought that house, I'd feel better about yourself. Like your, or, your or whatever, happiness. like you have this yearning to go do something and you feel like, Something would fill that void. And that something that would fill that void 
is probably travel or some sort for some people or getting a job or always trying that one thing that they wanted to do, whether that's being a fishing guide or a hunting guide or, or, or opening their own business or doing something. And instead of doing that, they say, well, maybe I'll just buy this new car right? or maybe I'll buy this new whatever boat. Maybe a boat's what I need. And they buy that. Of course, you can always sell it, but you lose some money. But they get in some situation to where now there's no getting out of it. Every month right. you're, you're paying something. And like a house, like a mortgage, you're not just paying the mortgage. You're paying the electric bill, the water bill, the insurance, the other things that come with it, the sewer, the trash, the other things that come with it. Plus, now you have a leak in the roof and you got to do all this other stuff. The old pipe bust. Now you have to fix that. And if you're going away for two months, well, somebody needs to check on the house mm -hmm. too. So now you're paying the neighbor kid, you know, 30 bucks a week. It all adds up. And so I guess the point of it is, is that if you have that yearning and you're asking me, when do you know it's time to get a mortgage? I would say it's time to get a mortgage when, when, when you are absolutely certain that your days of roaming, you're, you're comfortable with what you've done. Hmm. Not that you're never going to do it again, but you're comfortable with what you don't, you've done as far as that roaming, that adventure, that going and dropping everything and going. You're comfortable with that. You don't really need to, you might want to do that some more, but you don't really need it like you need water and food. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a poor period of your life where, where if you're like, you couldn't think about missing opening day of whatever, right? There's a period of your life where if you don't fish every single day all, for the whole summer, it's a complete disaster, mm -hmm. right? But then there's another period where it's kind of like, I'm not as, I mean, you hear a lot of people in the South, they say, well, I'm not as mad at them as I used to be, right? Like they don't hunt as hard as they used to. They don't fish as hard as they used to. They're enjoying their time, but it's not this, this driving passion to just catch everything you can, kill everything you can, whatever. And, and you're happy with it. And you've done this and you've, you've experienced all these things. There may be other things that you want to experience, but now it's time to move on to the next chapter of your life, which is raising a family or getting married starting or a career. starting a career or something to where you are satisfied with where you are in your life and where you are in your life is you want to become ingrained in this community. And you know what? If you don't feel like that, then rent. <laughs> like if, if you feel like I feel like I'm going to enjoy this job and I want to, I'm going to really give it everything I have but I don't know that I want to live in this particular town for the rest of my life. Rent. Mm -hmm. No, don't, don't buy because you need to keep a house for about six years before, in my opinion, six years before you make any kind of a profit on it and don't get any kind of tax problems by selling it. So, I mean, you can buy a car and sell it. If you buy a used car, you can probably buy it today and sell it tomorrow for about the same cost. If you buy a new car, you're going to buy it today, sell it tomorrow, and you're going to lose about what? I don't know. What What do you lose, Dad? 30%, 40%? About 30, yeah. As soon as you drive it off the lot, brand new car, mm -hmm. brand new drift boat, brand new skiff, brand new whatever, you're going to lose some value on it. So I don't know. Just be careful. Uh, I don't know if we answered your question right or not, but I think when you know, you know. Uh, but just things, um, shiny things usually don't fill the void of, of, of that's what, a temporary what you're looking for. fix. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, this is, this is, uh, from one of my buddies that I've known for about 30 years. Uh, he always drove the finest new cars that he could drive. In fact, when the Hummer first came out, he, he got him a big Hummer, but he he uh, lived on a golf course in the middle 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 of Tennessee, and he had a house in a subdivision, a very nice house. And he was out cutting his grass one day, and his neighbor was out there with him, and they started talking. And he said, "You know, uh, I know about how much money you make, and I know it's about the same amount of money that I make, 
but it seems like you just do so much better than I'm doing. And he said, what, what's your secret? And he said, Don, I'll tell you. He said, is one wife and used cars. <laughs> That's a pretty good piece of advice right there. Buy <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> used cars and don't get a divorce. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, this has been fun, and I want to thank you boys for putting up with me. Uh, it's not easy to babysit for an old fart, but uh, I've tried not to get in your way. And I did make a few good casts. I didn't get tangled up too bad in the in the weeds or the uh, trees, and I didn't get the didn't put too many wind knots in the. Well, you, you know, you do have to get it close to the bank to get it in the tree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I was quite a... F- <laughs> you also have to cast to get wind notes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. You know, as you as you get older and, and you just enjoy driving, he's not as mad at him as he used to be. That's it's right. just like what we were saying. Exactly. You enjoy just floating down the river, talking to your grandkids. Yeah, exactly. Definitely not. I think exactly. you got one bite and goes, I'm done. <laughs> 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 I'm done. Well, that's uh that's a good place to be. I mean, there there you are, there you go. That that right there, in my opinion, that's what happiness is. You're happy floating down the river, or you're happy catching a fish. You catch a fish and you say, I'm done. Like whatever. I'm I'm happy. I'm I'm doing what I want to do. I'm floating down this river. And you can take that and you can you can apply that to anything in in life. Like that's where you want to be. You want to be in that place to where you don't feel like you have to catch every fish in the river at some point in your life. You don't feel like you have to fish every day because you've done it and you're happy with it and you're happy where you are and you're happy with with where you are in life and what you've done and doing more of it is awesome, but doing less of it is is okay too. Right. Right. What do, Dad, what do you think is uh if you were to define happiness? What would you say? Well, I'd just say that uh, I'm there right now. Uh, I have a great wife. I have a three outstanding children and eight outstanding grandkids, and and that's a uh, something that I feel very rewarded in and very proud of. That and and very blessed that uh, up till now. We've had a good ride, and we're just going to do everything we can to keep it on the right track. Well, I'd ask you this as a closer. That's that's a really awesome place to be in your life, and I think that everyone aspires to be there. And I think that the the common belief is that, you know, when I'm 82 and I've got eight grandchildren and I've got three children and I've got a great wife and I just sold my house, I'm about to ex- exit my business, and Things, life's good. Life's good right now. How does life, how, how does a young person at 23, 24, how does a young person or somebody my age, 52, how do we get to that point? I mean, obviously I can't have eight grandchildren right now and I'm not to that point, but that doesn't mean I can't be happy. Right. So how does somebody that hasn't accomplished all of those things and is on the journey towards accomplishing all of those things, how does that person reach the same level of happiness and fulfillment that you have? Well, I think first of all, you've got to have a plan. Uh, You need to project where you'd like to be short term, long term, longer term and work toward that plan. And know that there's a period of time when uh, a, a day may be, you only have to work a half a day, but that day may be 36 hours long. <laughs> and you may have to just keep gutting it and, you know, you're sacrificing a few things in order for the reward it for the long term. Short term gratification is wonderful. But it is short term, so you got to continue to plan and work and 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 not have and and understand that you can't have everything 
now. And when you get to be 82, you still may not be able to have everything, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need everything. So but you kind of have to become at peace with yourself and where you want to be. Good advice. Boys, you got anything to add? Nope. <laughs> Aiden, you're a man a few words today. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Good advice. Yeah. Good advice. All right. Well, this has been awesome to uh, to have um, three generations um, on a new form of media. I told granddad we were going to do a podcast. He didn't know what that was, <laughs> where he could find it. Um, how, make sure you send it to me when when uh, when when it's done. Um, no, I'm just kidding. He knows what podcasts are. He listens to them all the time. Um, but anyway, this has been awesome, man. Thanks for thanks for doing it. I really appreciate it. And uh, let's go let's go check out those dinosaur bones. Great. Thanks so much again. All right. Until next week. See you. See you.